Precision rifle shooting, whether for hunting, competition, military or law enforcement, or just recreation, truly defines a zenith in a marksman's capability and the state of the art in weapons development. Today's precision shooter has the weapons and equipment at their disposal to engage targets at extreme ranges. However, if you don't utilize the fundamentals and don't have your weapon set up properly, each time you pull that trigger, you're just creating expensive noise. While Travis and I have been teaching more dynamic weapon manipulation and tactics, precision rifle is an area in which we defer to an expert. We're in the Panhandle of Texas at Accuracy First Training Facility to work with who we believe is the top precision rifle instructor in the world. His techniques, principles, and proprietary methods are utilized by all branches of the armed service, including sniper schoolhouse instructors and special operations groups around the world. Todd's teachings are so revolutionary that we can't even expose much of what's being taught to the military. But we'll assure you what you're about to see in this training series will amaze you and possibly redefine the standards of what is possible in the precision rifle community. All you have to do is apply the fundamentals, everything works out for itself. We're not trying to change the world, we're just trying to question everything. Hey Todd, thanks for having us out. Man, this is a truly amazing facility. I think I can speak for, for Steve, Mike, and Chris and myself. You know, coming from a, a more dynamic style of shooting and the speed templates that we have, um, I think we're about to gain a, a really big appreciation for, for the true art of uh, accuracy dynamics. I know for us, Todd, with a lot of the, the people that we teach, fundamentals are extremely important and people get wrapped around basic and advanced as terms and kind of fail to realize a lot of times what makes an advanced shooter is the understanding of the basic fundamentals done over and over and being very, very specific and methodical about that. So I would imagine it's going to relate here more than ever. Yeah, really, more than anything, it's basic fundamentals is what makes you high speed and the more you understand the fundamentals and how to apply them the further you can go out the faster you can shoot i've been shooting scoped rifles since i was six years old so i thought i was actually a pretty good shooter for a lot of years i'd shot deer at 800 meters antelope at 700 meters but until i started shooting out 2000 i finally realized i didn't know anything and i had to completely retrain myself which was how do i lay back behind the gun how do I actually apply pressures to the weapon system? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Basic fundamentals, basic techniques to apply everything together to give us that precision that we need at further distances. Well, that's what we really love about your program is it's just seeing some of the very basic fundamental things that you show uh, makes me really go, oh my God, why didn't I know this 10 years ago? You know, and specifically in combat operations for myself, um, it's, it's kind of like it's just all common sense, really. Yeah, well, what we're really trying to do in the long range world right now is trying to make this where long range is easy, all right? It doesn't have to be hard. The math doesn't have to be hard. A lot of people are a little bit scared of it because they don't understand it. Again, it's kind of like the fundamentals. Really what we're trying to do in changing a lot of the formulas that we're using and all is to really work and make the math really simple. There's no reason to make it hard. So we're trying to get it to where everybody can do it and it's really not that hard of a deal. I'm definitely excited to find out. All right, that sounds good. Let's get our guns and get on the line. All right, guys, what we have in front of us today is an MSR. This is set up in 300 Win Mag version. Uh, in about three and a half minutes, we could actually swap it over and turn it to 338 Lapua. All right, uh, this is a 5 to 25 scope, has a locking turrets on it. It's a really nice scope. And guys, for accuracy, this is one of the most important things you can have. All right, 
you really need a good set of scope rings. A lot of people that aren't familiar with levers aren't real comfortable with them, but the way the camming system actually works, I've actually seen it locked in a Picatinny rail and once you set it on the rail and you're looking with a scope camera and it's already locked on, all right, when you actually start moving those levers, you'll see that crosshair come right back down to the same point every time. Now we've shot them on and off, on and off, taking them off, shoot one shot, putting them back on, take one shot, take them off, put it back on, take a shot, and did it for 100 shots. All right, in that 100 shot process, it still maintained the MOA of what the gun could actually shoot, so we saw no impact shift. And I shoot them on all my guns. I think they're very important to have a really good, accurate set of, of rings. One of the biggest problems that I deal with with a lot of uh, the shooters that I train is parallax. A lot of people really don't understand parallax. We're type A personalities, all right? So we make things happen most of our life. Well, the problem with that is a lot of times it may not be perfect, but we're trying to make it happen and get through it. So that's one of the initial things that we'll actually set up. After we get the eye relief, we'll actually set up and, and work on uh, scope parallax. Like I said earlier, you know, I had made shots out to, you know, seven, 800 yards on, on deer and antelope. And I was, I was really getting away with a lot of stuff because I really didn't know what I was doing. I was actually getting lucky. And, you know, even though most of the time we don't shoot at the extended ranges to where our arrows start showing up, you know, uh, a lot of people shoot three, four, 500 meters. And really that's not long range shooting. Long range shooting, most of the time, our weapons are certainly more capable of that. You know, we take 308s and push them out to a mile on 16 inch plates. So it's, it's, they're very capable, the caliber is capable. Uh, as long as we do our fundamentals properly, that's where you're gonna start seeing the accuracy come in. So what we're gonna actually show you now is the things that I learned when I started shooting out to two grand with 338s and really kind of working the precision piece of what I had to do to retrain myself actually how to shoot out to that distance. And then we're gonna get Steve on the gun, gonna get him set up, show him eye relief and then scope parallax. First thing I want you to do is, is line up directly behind the weapon system. So, you know, it's coming right underneath inside your knee. When you lay down on the gun here, you're gonna use the rear bag. I don't want you to have pulse on the weapon system. All right, so that means I don't want you to use this hook, all right, because that's applying pulse. I want you to actually utilize the rear bag for your aiming, all right? You don't want a lot of heavy cheek pressure on. I want you to actually lay up here and like you're, you're, you're fixing to go to sleep. That's how much pressure I want on the cheek pad, all right? Then, guys, the way I teach most of my guys that I train, we only grip the gun when we're shooting at close ranges, all right? So if I need to actually watch where my bullet's actually hitting at close ranges to where I can't use my normal precision grip, we'll actually go ahead and grip the weapon system. I never wrap my thumb around the backside unless I'm shooting something like an SR. And, and uh, just out of curiosity, why is that? What, why would you not run your thumb around that grip? Because that's what most people do. Yeah, it's sympathetic movement. I found that when I was shooting out to two grand, we had an eight foot piece of sheetrock. And when I would wrap my hand, the sympathetic movement is I pulled my uh, trigger finger, my thumb would actually collapse with it a little bit. Okay. And a as I did that, I would have some shots on target and some shot would completely miss eight foot sheetrock. So there's some inconsistencies in there with what a your absolutely. hand's doing. Absolutely, and we do the same thing with the palm of our hand. So a lot of times the first thing that you do when you line up your scope, you're gonna make sure that your scope is level on target, all right? Because any cant in there will throw the bullet off in that direction of the cant. So a lot of times, most people actually set up their bipods too tight. This one's actually set up real nice. I can set it up, turn it a little bit, let it go and it'll stay there. You don't want it to where it flops like that left and right and it won't stay up. But what you do want is to where I can adjust it slightly without moving. You don't want it to go uh, and now it's too much. All right, so you actually loosen it up to where you can turn it a little bit and let it go. What you don't want to do is apply pressure to level your reticle and have to hold that pressure while you're pulling the trigger, right? Because that bullet's gonna go somewhere else because it's gonna be real hard to be consistent. And consistency's everything. That's what a ransom rest does for us, right? A ransom rest is a device that we lock a weapon system into and it ha applies the same pressure to the weapon system every time to allow the weapon system to actually perform to its capability. 
I know lots of school thought for where I came from, and I know Chris has been taught this too, is to torque that thing down as much as possible. So you're basically saying, um, let the gun tell you uh, what you're doing instead of, yeah. let, let the gun tell you what your body's doing instead of you just fighting the gun, and now you're adding tension. Yeah, the, the whole thing with long range precision, we have to let, we have to allow the weapon system to do what it can do. All right, we don't want to uh, apply any pressures or push any errors that we have into the weapon system. So if I'm having to apply pressure to and hold it there, all right, that's gonna create inconsistency from shot to shot. But if I can actually set it up properly and then apply the same pressures on the gun every time, I'm just allowing the weapon to do what it can do for every ac whatever accuracy it's capable of. Well, I think that's two of the big things that have helped me is, is not torquing the bipods and cheek well because I've had some schools of thought say you need to put a lot of cheek pressure into that gun, get it in the pocket, tighten it up as much as possible so you're, you're not letting that gun move. But um, I think it's actually a little bit easier to let the gun move yeah, so you can see what it's actually doing. Yeah, a absolutely. What, what we end up doing in teaching long range precision, we'll set up, put our fingertips here on the front of the grip and then I'll cool up once I get on target. And I'm looking through and I can see the target get a natural point of aim. I pull this into my shoulder so it's the exact same amount of pull every time starting in this position. Since my upper body is partially cooled up, then we load the bipod till it starts to move like that. Loading it so, forward. Yeah, yeah, I load forward. Now I've actually tested, like you was talking earlier on Cheekwell, right? I've actually tested shooting groups, pushing down hard, barely resting on it, and then the pressure about like here where I'm about to go to sleep, all right? So, in all the testing that we did for groups, we found that the same weight that you would actually just lay on it like you were resting is the pressure that actually performed the best. Now loading the bipods, we did the same thing. You can shoot with a reverse load, you can shoot with a neutral load, or a forward load on the bipod. The problem is we can't be consistent with the reverse load. Yeah, how we much can't tell you, is that? is that a neutral load or is that a neutral load? Is that a neutral load? We don't know, all right? But the same amount of pressure every time, just to where they start to roll out and hold that same amount of pressure each time, that's consistent. Now you can shoot good groups with a neutral load, all right? But the propensity for flyers is much greater, all right? So we, we know that with the same pressures applied, every time we're gonna get the consistency that we're looking for, all right? So what we end up doing, to go over it again real quick, once we find the target, we cool up, pull into our shoulder, and then we load with our bipods in, into the target. And we're ha same pressure now, again, like I said earlier, if you're actually shooting something close, the knowledge is everything. You have to know where that bullet hit. You know, you shouldn't have to uh, rely on somebody else telling you where your bullet hit if it's visible, all right? So if it's visible, I wanna actually pull in tight like this. I'm still not wrapping my thumb. I'm pulling in tight like this, not applying a lot of pressure sideways, taking the shot, run the bolt, going back down, back on target quickly. But I've obtained the knowledge of where that bullet impacted. I know where I broke the shot, therefore I can make a more knowledgeable second shot correction if needed. Is there more than one way to load the bipod? Not really. Well, what I end up doing is actually as I cool up, I'm doing my preload right here into my shoulder, and now I'm just laying my shoulder into it. What you don't want to do is drive the gun. You don't want to be up on top of the of the gun here like this and pushing down on it like this. What you really want is to be up underneath the gun, back here with your shoulder, let it ride up in the proper position. Uh, again, this is what we're talking about with different weapon systems. Some are capable of that adjustment and some are not, you know, and we're gonna go through those. Are you driving with your feet or your toes at all? No, I try not to drive with anything but my back. My back and my shoulders actually push the gun, but as you can see, I'm not trying to push this thing five inches. Yeah, all I'm doing is getting the same amount of pressure each time. So I go to that point right there. Now, if you are on concrete up on top of a building or you know with some of the tactical guys or you're out in the field and you're hunting, you're gonna have a different feel, all right, with your bipods. It may be sliding more or not as much. It may be heavy dirt where you can kind of dig in and then push. You need to see where your bullet's gonna hit with all different types of loads because you know, you're gonna load heavy on some, you're gonna load light because you can't load. You may have it on top of a building, set on the back of a vehicle, something like that, where you can't load into it. Now, if we can, we'd even load into this in, in an instance like that. But you still need to notice, or you still need to take note and see where your bullets are hitting under all conditions, you know, at zero, at 100 meters.
Look, one, one question I have is traditional military shooting over a ruck. A lot of guys don't like bipods. A lot of guys just shoot on rucks. Yeah, you, you know, shooting off ruck, there's no problem with that. It's a good, accurate way of shooting. Uh, this is a, physics will tell you that this is actually a more accurate way of shooting. Now, something, and the reason I say that, if you look out towards the end of your weapon system, you have two points of contact here and way out here in front. All right, that creates stability. As I move a ruck up under this point, it creates a fulcrum. So the gun is actually can pivot. Now you can you have more surface area contact, but in reality you have this much surface area contact because all of it's being supported. To where you bring the ruck in underneath you and you're shooting off of it, it's not quite as stable. And I, I've seen a lot of guys shoot off rucks. Uh, you know, we even shoot off of them in different positional stuff. They're not as accurate as this is. When when I do testing for the military and I'm testing weapon systems or ammo, that's what we're doing. We're, I mean, it was stated to me, you will shoot off a bipod, you know, and you will shoot off the ground. You're not gonna shoot off a bench. You know, this was the way the weapon's gonna be employed. This is the way the we weapon will be tested. Obviously, if it was more accurate to test it the other way, when we're doing accuracy testing, they would want me to do it that way. All right, Steve, hop on the gun. We're gonna go through a couple of things, talking about eye relief. I'm gonna kind of straighten in your body out a little bit. What I want you to do is go ahead and move your body over in this position, move to the right. All right, that looks good. All right, now what you, what you wanna do is go ahead and move this leg out. All right, now you have a nice straight spine. You ought to be comfortable. What are you using as a reference, Todd? Basically to what I'm sure trying to do- directly behind yeah. the gun. I, I wanna run, I wanna run the gun. The weapon system needs to be run in a line just inside his right knee from center of his right cheek to inside his right knee is acceptable. Some guys will run just nearly on the knee because they're not used to it. I wasn't used to this way of shooting either. I had to retrain myself because what I noticed was I could hit that sheet rocket two grand some shots, some shots I was completely off of it. So what I had to do is start from my feet, same way I used to teach myself on pistol. Start at the very basics. How am I standing? What's my stance? What's my draw? You know, everything, you know. So what, what we did with the rifle was the same technique, same, th same thought process. Start from the feet. How do we approach the weapon system? How much load do we have on it? Just trying to be a ransom rest for the weapon system to perform off of. And that's what we're after. Would you say also, you know, coming from a community what that, uh, I mean, I, I shoot what I believe is directly behind the gun just from what we do, mm -hmm. but I've also seen a lot of long range shooters where they're almost on an angle um, as, they're, as they're shooting. And you see that in a lot that's of photographs or a lot of articles. So my question to you is, one, does that screw or can it have the potential to screw with accuracy? Two, not only that, but recoil management. I know for what we do for follow-up fast shots in, in our arena, we try to stay directly behind a gun so our skeleton can absorb most of it. Absolutely. So I guess my final question is, if I was shooting a big bore caliber and I have this offset behind the gun, does, does that negatively affect me? Absolutely, you're, you're exactly correct. What I'm gonna do is move you in a bad position now to, to show. All right, so kick off over to the left side there. All right, keep going. Keep going. Normally people raise a leg yeah. almost. Yeah, go ahead and raise your leg up. Yeah. So a lot of guys, you'll see when they'll kick that leg out and they're gonna curl their arm up underneath the weapon system. I'm gonna show you the effects of it. Now, a lot of times, why did we do this? All right, we did it to get our diaphragm up off the ground so our breathing didn't adversely affect our sight picture and what we're seeing and where the bullets are going. All right, so the problem with that is most of the guys I train don't have the opportunity to say, all right, hey, breathe in, breathe out. It's not target shooting, you know? So, and in that environment, they have to shoot on a minute's notice at any time, all right? So, it's, you know, it's just like hunting. If you're laying there and all of a sudden that prairie dog jumps out of his hole, you have that split shot, you know, to take. It's not target shooting, all right? So, and there's nothing wrong with target shooting. There's nothing wrong if you have the time in taking a shot doing that. But I train my guys to shoot the same way that we're breathing right now. So we're taking breaths constantly, just like we're talking in and out. We're breathing, we're talking, we're aiming. You're constantly aiming the whole time. All right, the problem with this type of setup, especially when you start getting the 338s and weapon systems that actually have some recoil, you're gonna see that this weapon system can actually break his shoulder back. You know, the skeletal will actually bend back like that, scope, kisses him in the forehead. I mean, I've been cut three times back in my younger year and even with a 50 cal not too long ago because of uh, another situation the way that we were shooting it. But 
if, if you actually line up properly, you can actually have full control of the recoil. But what I'm going to show you now is, if you'll actually watch, all right, go ahead and mount the gun in your shoulder. All right. Now, when I, you're going to see a little recoil, all right? Now, what you're going to see is the way it moves his spine. The adverse effects of it, all right? I'm not saying he won't hit his target shooting in this direction, but most of the time the guys can't get back on target and see where their bullet hit. And knowledge of where your bullet hit is key. So I'm going to feed him a little recoil, and you're going to see how it kind of moves him around, all right? As you, as you do that, and it turns his body like that, when he comes back down, he's going to have to be wiggling around trying to find his target again. He's lost that knowledge. So by moving him back around, go ahead and scoot back around. All right. And moving Steve is not an easy task. <laughs> yeah, it's not. That's a lot of man. What I'm feeling is, is a lot of the stock on the Keller ball. Right yeah, now. actually the stock needs to be right in the pocket. Can you, I mean, right there. Can you feel that little pocket? Yep. That's, that's actually where you want the weapon system to set. All right, so when you actually have a nice adjustable stock like this, you can actually move the cheek piece up and down or even move this butt piece up and down as well. It's very adjustable. And so that's one of the nice things about different types of weapon systems and some of the advantages that we get out of them is adjustability. So we're going to go through some things real quick. All right, again, we're going to move fingers to where they're right in front. All right, place just like that on the front of the weapon system. Thumbs on the right side. He's using only the rear bag for aiming, all right? He's in a good line with his body. Now, this is about minimal, all right? Actually, I would actually want him to scoot it out in this position. And with a lot of my students, I actually do this to them. I actually take the weapon system away from them, all right? Go ahead and be comfortable, lay down, all right? Just like you're gonna take a nap, all right? Then I actually mount the weapon system just in a perfect position like this. All right, go ahead and grab the gun, all right? Rear bag it up. And that is actually a perfect body position right now. His spine is straight. He shouldn't have any muscle tension trying to hold him in that position. All right, now that he's got his fingers in the right position, his elbow's pushed out. All right, you want your elbow full pushed out. That way you don't get that break back of your shoulder under recoil and that scope doesn't kiss you in the forehead. So you can shoot 338s without even a break, something that's gonna recoil pretty heavily if you shoot it properly, it's going to push you away. It's going to fall right back down on target. All right. How much pressure are you looking for in the weapon hand? Actually, just enough, the same amount every time pulling in my shoulder. It, it's a fair amount, but you're not gripping it. And that's one reason I decided to go with that grip. I, I couldn't actually grip it and rip it into my shoulder. Now, some weapon systems, you do have to do that too. And you know, a lot of the AR style platforms that we shoot, you have to grip them pretty hard and pull them into your shoulder hard and kind of manhandle them. Uh, some of the other AR platforms like the LaRue OBR, you don't have to shoot that way, but because of the machining of the OBR, OBR, you have a semiconductor machinist building them with such good tolerances that still run when they're dirty because he knows what he's doing and he's able to actually put them together to where you can shoot them just like a bolt gun. And on those other guns that have loose tolerances, you got to actually torque them, pull them in to tighten up the tolerances yourself. Absolutely. That's a great thing about Absolutely. it. But you would have to do that every single time. Every, every time. Another, time. It's that, that, that whole consistency well, and important. accuracy thing. That's important for people to realize because they're like, well, what's going on with my gun? What's going on with my gun? I got this $3,000 setup that I, that I frank and gun together. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, it's it's because of that simple simple fact yeah, is the tolerances are too and loose. They, and they may have a thousand dollar barrel in it yeah. and not understand why their their groups are shooting you know shooting horribly. And so. ARs are big right now. I mean that's the, you know that's that's a very important thing to think about is is those tolerances. You got to be consistent in that grip every single time you grab that gun. One well, neat deal about with ORs, it's kind of the 1911. You can do a lot of different things to it. Kind of like the 1022. You can do a lot of different things. So you can kind of build your own gun in your garage. You know, so it's a neat weapon system. But when you're actually putting parts together and building your own weapon system, you got to be aware of the tolerances. You know, and, and we don't have the ability, most of us, to go in there and buy a bolt and mic it and pick the one out that's going to fit right for your for your weapon system. So. When you look at buying one, understand that that's some of the advantages that you're getting when you buy from a quality weapon producer is, or manufacturer, you're gonna actually get a weapon system that potentially, not all of them, you know, we'll be honest and say that some are good and some are not, but you're gonna find that the good ones, that's the reason why they're good. The tolerances are where you can actually shoot them. And if you don't have one like that, you can still get the most out of it in accuracy by doing just like you said 
applying the same torque to that handle every time, holding it, pulling in hard to make those tolerances react the same every time as you're shooting the weapon system. All right, so now that he's actually gripped up, he's pulling into his weapon system, all right, he's relaxed, he has no tension, all right, because we're type A's, we've got this closed right now. I'm gonna pop it open, he's gonna look and tell me if he has any scope shadow. A little bit. All right, move your head until you don't have scope shadow. All right, so he had to come forward. So initially, there's a couple of things we could do. We could actually collapse the buttstock down or we can actually move the scope back towards him. All right, you ready? You relaxed? All right. Any? Nope. All right, good. so he's good. So we'll go ahead and we'll close these down. Now, what you're gonna wanna see is you're gonna see them get tied about 60 degrees out, anywhere from 45 to 60. I like 60, all right? And then you can mash them in, all right? But you still, you need to be able to put a knuckle behind them to get them off. You know, if you can reach up there and just flip that thing off, it's not tight enough. And we'll actually tighten this up a little bit more than it is right now before um, we start shooting. For a lot of the military that uses like a Badger ordinance style rings, you know, your classic military rings that you see out there, what should those be torqued to? once you get things set to where they need to be. Yeah, they need to be torqued down to 65 inch pounds. Most people will tighten these up, you know, to about 20 is okay. what most time everybody does. Uh, I, I'm probably a little bit more, you know, I don't, want, I don't want stuff to get loose. I use real high quality gear and I, I can torque these down to 25, no problem. I don't gotcha. get any the actual, the actual scope ring. The little yeah, screw. Yeah. The scope screws or the, the mounts. And then uh, on the normal style that, that has a, uh, uh, a nut, you'd want to torque that down to 65. Todd, do you feel it's an urban myth or is it important, the procedure of mounting one of these Picatinny interface bases to set them in the rail and load them forward before oh, no. operating the, the a Absolutely, and that's, when, when I actually put that on, that was something that we actually did. Once you put it on, this hand, I just didn't talk through it, but you're exactly right. You want to push it towards the front of the scope, the weapon system because that's where it's wanting to go under recoil. You don't want to actually zero it back here and then take several shots and finally eventually it slides forward on you. All right? But yeah, as, as you start putting it on, I'm already pushing forward and locking it into, into place. Now, that's a good question though. Now, once now is that set up proper again for you to get it back in the same holes? Good. All right, you're good. I take these little scope or these rail clips, and I'll actually place them right here in front of his scope. So if I take it off, now I know exactly where I need to go back to because not every tooth is actually going to give you the same amount of accuracy. All right, this is precision work. You know, we're not just trying to get it in a one inch pacey somewhere so we can move on and do other things. Now, when do you think you would ever want to take your scope off? Because I know a lot of guys are like, I'm never touching it. Once it's there, it's there. You know, tactically, there's a lot of reasons uh, you'd want to take the scope off uh, when you're jumping in, you know, in other types of missions that, uh, that, that, that they do, they can run in with different type of optics on and then move into, you know, a different type of scope, a long range shooting scope. But, you know, even I backpack in up in the mountains and I'll carry my weapon system and if it's going to be, you know, a certain type of hike or if, if I'm actually packing it in, because I take my scopes and fly with them all the time. I'll ship my weapons, you know, underneath the belly of the airplane, but I'm going to take this, you know, nice piece of glass and it's riding with me, you know, uh, up in cabin class. So, but <laughs> right. most of the time it rides in first and I'm still trying to work that out. If I can leave my bag in first, it gets to ride in first, but I go back and sit with. What do you think about lapping rings on? You know, that's a good question. You know, you really need to if you don't buy quality. rings, quality rings. Quality and, rings. And, and to be honest, I've never had to touch any of the LaRue's and I run LaRue's on everything because they are super high quality. But if you do have a set of rings that you want to use, Running a lapping set through it, it's, not be, hurt. I, it, it's, it's actually probably needed, you know, because I've seen a lot of them to where there's only contact. You take them off, you look at them, and only the first maybe quarter inch was the only thing that was ever touching. Mm. All right, so you'll see those scopes slip and slide back because you don't have that surface contact. So as you lap it, you're actually getting more to actually hold, getting a better bite. All right, so. Now, once you go through the process, all right, so you've actually loaded up, pulled into your shoulder, you're gonna kinda cool up as you're looking at the target. And guys, all this, 
needs to be while you're actually zeroed on the target. You already have your crosshairs on the target, or if you're using a system like this that has H58 Horus reticle in it, you're actually going to place, you know, maybe a four mil hold on the target. You're going to place that four mil hold on the target when you're cooled up, and then as you load into the bipod, that natural point of aim is very important. Uh, what you don't want to do is push and then try to waller over here and get your four mils back on the target or your wind hold. If you're holding two mils to the right, you want to hold, line up with two mils right, load into it. Because what you don't want to do is push in and then torque it over. You're applying pressures to the weapon system that you want, don't want it to be there to, to maintain the accuracy that you want. All right, so what I, what I want you to do is go ahead and load the bipod. All right, so you're going to do it slowly. All right, right there. You see how it just barely moved? Yeah, you could hear it right. creak. As it starts to move, don't stop. Just hold what you got. Because if you stop and relax, you've just lost everything that you gained. All right? So, and it's going to be a little bit different today unless you've been used to doing this because what you're going to get is every now and then the guy won't load his bipod. So he shoots, shoots, and all of a sudden he has a high flyer. And while he had a high flyer, you can actually watch. He didn't load his bipod, and the gun's going to rock back you know, exponentially more than it did in the previous shots, it's going to change his launch angle of his barrel and he's going to hit high. Mm. All right, so that's something that we'll watch today once we get going. All right, so the big deal is it's just consistency. Long range is really easy. You know, precision accuracy is pretty easy. All you have to do is apply the fundamentals. Everything works out for itself. My question is, Todd, what about length of pull in the gun? I, you know, I get that a lot. I get guys that, you know, Talk about length of pull, kind of like we did with our shotgun back when we was, you know, in growing up shooting quail and dove, you know, setting up different guns for us. The reality is because the way that you're shooting that weapon system right now, length of pull doesn't have anything to do with it, all right? You know, if you're shooting a shotgun and I'm mounted up here like this and I'm swinging with clay pigeons or I'm shooting quail or dove, absolutely, you need a gun that's fitted for you. But what we're doing, most of my guns are an inch under what you would consider a normal length of pull. All right, so if you're running a 13 and a half, I'm probably a 12 and a half, you know, off of a normal 13 and a half length of pull. Because you can shoot with a shorter gun, all right, but it's real hard to shoot with a longer gun. And what we initially do, if we don't set the scope up right, you see guys start canning off to the right, or canning off the left side of their gun. And now they're offline, now they can't actually see their impact. So, you know, once we get into it, you're gonna see a lot of little changes from, you know, what we've thought, in the past was the correct way to do it. And, and we're not trying to change the world, we're just trying to question everything. You know, I tell my instructors that I teach, if you have anything that you're fixing to go over that you haven't tested but you aren't for sure, go out and test it. You know, it's not it's not what we teach. And I'm sure y'all feel the same yeah, way. Absolutely. It's not what we teach is what's right, because we don't matter. What matters is where the bullet hit. The bullet's the truth. So if you actually teach where the bullet hits, you can't be wrong. All right, nobody can argue with you. They're arguing with where, where the bullet hit. All right, so my deal is it's not it's not me. It's not my opinion. You know, it's not. I don't build my formulas off some math scale that I've got in my head. I built my formulas off where the bullet hit. So you ain't gonna argue with where the bullet hit. If you do, if you argue with that, you're gonna lose. It's not me. I'm just writing everything based off the knowledge of where the bullet hit. Once you get on target, what I want you to do is go ahead and line up on one of the dots, all right? The first thing we're gonna do is adjust your ocular focus until you have a real crisp reticle, all right? You do that back here at the rear of the scope, all right? You see it getting blurry and getting hopefully sharp, but I want you to take your hand up here and actually move this until your reticle is super crisp. Now, different scopes, you're gonna see different things. Todd, what magnification should you adjust the ocular? I actually, I, I do it on full. All right, because you're going to see the parallax. It, the, the more power you have, the more parallax you're actually So there's a see. lot of different procedures I've seen out there. Is that specific just for this scope? No. We can no, go ahead and look at it and make the adjustment? Yeah. Because I've, I've also seen it done in the past with either your technique with the scope cover closed or actually panning up at the sky with something featureless and looking away from it and then looking, does it immediately appear? Yeah, I, actually, that's a real good question. Uh, what we were doing with flipping the scope on and off was, or the scope cap cover on and off was actually getting the proper eye relief. Mm. All right, so okay. since we're type A personalities, he's not pinching forward. So if I have it closed and he opens it, I see him move forward. But to actually get it, a lot of times, since we're type A's, we'll load into it and go, yeah, yeah, I'm good. 
well, you're not really good. You need to actually be relaxed on the weapon system. So this allows us to actually find the student's relaxed position and open it up. Now, what we're doing with ocular focus, you're, you're right. If you look at the sky or look at a white object, something like that, and get real fine, crisp edges, you're correct. I, I found that when I was younger, I had 20-10 vision. So even now, I can see really well far away, but I can't see very good close up. It's actually a little bit of an advantage for what I do in long-range training is because I can look at your scope real quick and tell if your parallax is screwed up because your reticle is going to be blurry for me. My eyes don't adjust. And that's why they're making the younger eyes actually look up at the sky, look at something white, you know, look out and look back in the scope because your eyes will adjust to something pretty fast. And that's what we're actually seeing with the students that we're working with. I'll get down behind the weapon system and you'll see that their reticle is blurry. And then I'll adjust it adjust the parallax, adjust the ocular focus, adjust the parallax. All right, everything's set. I move my head around, nothing's moving. I'm good to go. And I asked him to hop back on the gun. He goes, yeah, man, it looks great. Well, it looked great to him a while ago, but because his eyes adjusted really fast. And that's why we actually have to pull our eye out. We, if you have really good young eyes, pull your eye out of the scope, look somewhere else, pull back in, and you have to take a quick assessment of whether your reticle's blurry or not, because your eye, if you have good eyes, will adjust pretty fast. So. Go ahead and adjust it to it's super crisp. Once your reticle is super crisp, then we're gonna actually take and turn your parallax knob until your target is really crisp. All right, this may take a couple adjustments, but we'll walk you through it. So now I want you to aim at the top of a reference mark, anywhere on the target, all right? As you, as you line up on the reference mark, slowly I want you to move your head up and down without manipulating the weapon system at all. All right, so as you're moving your head up and down, you're probably still seeing a little bit of movement, separation. So what we're doing is putting the crosshairs right on top of a dot or a line, and as he's moving his head, you'll see separation from the crosshairs to where he was aiming, all right? And that becomes a problem because if we don't remove all this parallax, if I move my head from here up to here for the next shot, where I think I'm aiming at is not where the weapon was actually sighted for and where I'm really aiming at. All right, so that's where you see that big jump. So and you go up and down, right? Yeah, okay, you'll go I'm, up and down because the cheek well is going to keep you from really going left and right really well. Because I've been taught left and right, left and right, mm. and just get behind, shake, shake, Yeah, shake. You, you can, you can get behind. As long as you're not moving the gun, it really doesn't matter. All right, so you, a lot of times you can set a rear back up under it and just move your head any direction. It really doesn't Point, matter. So your head obviously moves more naturally up and down. Yeah, usually I just work my head up and down slightly like this. And I mean, in I didn't even realize what I was doing. I was working with some Marines uh, out in Utah doing high angle training, and I found myself, uh, they were laughing at me. And I was like, all right, guys, give it up. What's up? And they said, every time you look through glass, you check your parallax. And I, and I said, yeah, you're supposed to. He said, no, even on the spotting scope. And it became such a habit to me every time I look through a piece of glass, even when it's my spotting scope, I look through it, I catch my head wiggling. I didn't know it until they told me. Now it's something I'm self-conscious about. So, I mean, but, but you catch yourself wiggling your head, just slight little movements to check for parallax. All right, so once he does this, if there was a slight amount of movement, he adjusts the rear ocular focus slightly, again, till it's real crisp. I mean, it still may stay crisp, but you move it in one direction, all right? Reset your parallax or target focus, make the target as crisp as possible, and then move your head again. If it's a little better, you continue in that direction. If it's a little worse, you back off in the other direction. And you do this, and guys, most of the time, this is one of the number one things I see with everybody that comes through the class. We don't spend enough time adjusting our parallax properly to where we don't see the effects downrange. You know, and, and one thing uh, everybody always wonders, if you set up a gun for one person as opposed to uh, two people, can two people shoot the same gun? Well, sometimes they can, depends, all right? Sometimes they can't. If the parallax is actually fixed, you're probably gonna be able to shoot really close, all right, if it was adjusted properly, all right? Because all that we're doing, because of ergonomics between our eye and our cheek weld here, we're moving automatically up because of your ergonomics. So if he zeroes a gun, I should be able to get on that same gun and hit the same spot if the parallax was perfect. Because if the crosshairs are lined up with where the bullet's going, doesn't matter what we're looking through. If I put a scope camera on it and I'm looking at a monitor and I line it up and shoot, it's the same thing, all right? But because we don't fix a parallax, I mean, this is something I really didn't understand was that big of a problem in the shooting community was most scopes aren't fixed to where there is no parallax in them. You know, you can adjust them. Some are harder than others, 
but you can adjust that scope parallax out to where most of the time it's it's pretty nice you know and there's not that much movement obviously some scopes you probably can't get it completely out therefore you to you to you will have a different impact shift determined by where your eye is placed in, inside the scope all right so let's hop on our other guns and let's talk through the different variables that we have with different weapon systems All right, guys, we've already covered the safety brief. Let's go ahead and lock and load, and we're hot. All right, go ahead and get behind the weapon system. All right, kick your left leg out a little bit more. That straightened up your spine a little bit. That's real good body position. Now, with the LaRue OBR, you don't have to actually grip it real hard here. It's just a light grip. You don't have to use the same grip that we use on the Remington MSR, but it's, it's just a real light grip and a good heavy load on the bipod. The gun really likes that. Okay, All right. I'm loaded. Yep. And you've already set the parallax? Parallax is set. And I'm on a 200 220, 30 yard parallax at 100 yards. So, where most people, I think, where I was used to, like, hey, put it on 100, I'm at 100, I'm at 200, put it at 200, 300, put it at 300. What do you think about that? Well, not all the dials are actually calibrated perfectly. So, and I'm, I've shot different types of scopes to where you're shooting at, you know, 700 meters with your dial set on 300. Mm -hmm. So I really don't ever pay attention to that. Most times, spent bender is nearly dead on. It may be what you're seeing with your eyeglasses, with the perception of what is actually clear or not. Uh, most of the time, the spent bender scope is closer than the rest of them, but it's, it's one of those deals, I don't even care what it says. I just turn the dial till my target is in focus and I'm good to go. Now, something else we should probably talk about real quick is eyewear. Um, I mean, we are precision shooting here. I mean, most people think, hey, when you're shooting a weapon period, you should always have eyes and ears on. However, there can be some difference uh, with when you put another lens behind these lenses. Is that correct? Absolutely. It depends on your eyewear. Uh, and good quality eyewear may not give you a problem. Uh, obviously, poor quality eyewear is going gonna, is gonna to create a lot of problems for you. And, and what you got to look at, you know, if you're square behind the gun and you're looking through your scope and you actually can't your head slightly, you know, to get on your cheek weld, you're inducing an error, you know, if your eyewear is not good. So initially what I tell you to do is set up your parallax without your eyeglasses on and sit there and make sure it's perfect. And then if you want to shoot with eyewear for safety reasons, then you can go ahead and, and look at it. But then adjust for your glasses the same way that you check for parallax. Mm -hmm. you sit, put your glasses down, move your head back and forth, figure out which angle you're going to be shooting with your eye looking through those glasses and see if there's a movement with your reticle on the target. Okay. All right. You're running the 110, all right? 110 is a current military system, all right, that is in service today. Uh, this weapon system, you don't need to shoot with a light grip. You need to try and manhandle this gun, all right? You want to make sure that your bipod, that's good, it's not too tight. You make it actually make it just a little bit looser, all right? That's pretty good there. All right, now, you actually want to go ahead and grip this gun. I would actually put my thumb around on this gun. Okay. All right, you really need to, what, what I try and tell the guys to do every time is you want to take out the play in this gun as much as possible. So once you line up your crosshairs, you can have your crosshair just slightly canted on the target and bring it in the same every time. You really want to grip it hard and pull it into your shoulder too. And then once you get lined up, then you actually load into it and break the shot. And mainly what I'm looking at is being consistent with that consistent grip every single time. Yes. And torque on the gun is what you're saying. A absolutely. That consistency is everything in, in shooting. So obviously in precision shooting, it's even that much more. So if you actually do your job properly every time, we can probably keep the gun somewhere around a minute. Okay. All right. All right, Mike, that is near perfect body position, all right? Yeah. You got your parallax set? Everything look good? Um, I'm having a little trouble with the, the comb height. When I get behind and, and lay down like I'm falling asleep, like you were saying before, yep. I'm looking towards the, the bottom portion of this. All right, uh, let's fix that. All right, what I'm going to have you do, I'm going to move this up. All right, now go ahead and place your cheek. Okay, it's looking a lot better. Need to come up? No, that's just about perfect. All right, maybe head away.
All right, let's go ahead and check that. Let's go ahead and open your boat and see if it'll clear. It'll do fine since it's a short action. So if it's a long action, it may give us a little bit of a problem, but that'll be fine. We'd have to actually drop it, take the bolt out. That's another reason I really like folders. You don't have to keep taking your cheek weld off every time you clean your gun and trying to reposition it. You just fold it out of the way like we will on this other weapon system over here. Is that better? It's a lot better. All right, keep working with that. Steve, scoot to the right just a little bit. There you go. Block out your right elbow. There, better. All right. Your line's coming down right through there of your, your stock. So right here is where you're at. Everything looks good. Yeah, good. And when in shooting bolt guns, Mike and Steve both will shoot with your fingertips right on the front. All right, shooting gas guns, you're gonna go ahead and grip the gun. Okay. All right, this is precision, all right? We're siding in, we're not doing snaps and movers, all right, where we need to go ahead and grip the gun, even a bolt gun. So what we're gonna actually do is run the bolt guns gripped up like this, loaded with a medium load into our shoulder, good forward load on the bipod, break the shot. Everybody's good? All right. All right, everybody go ahead and start off. Line's hot. All right, Travis, last target on the right, center diamond. We like to really refine our aiming reference points. We just want to shoot at the center of a big black square. All right, so. Center diamond. Yeah, center diamond, right on the apex. Heavy load on the bipod, light grip. All right, go ahead and send me another one. Bottom of the apex, six o'clock hold on the center diamond. Perfect. All right, send another one. All right, I'd probably come up for the average of my group right now, I'd come up one click. So that's sub half inch group, that's good. All right, Chris, you up? Yep. All right, target number three, aim top left corner. All right. Can you see that? Yep. Top left corner of the paper. Give me a shot. All right, give me another one. All right, one more. All right, go ahead and come down three clicks and come left three. Mike, you up? I am. All right, target number two. Okay. Give me 12 o'clock on the center diamond. All right, send one more. All right, that was perfect. Send me one more. It's an inch left. Your elevation is good now. Send me one more. We may have to go ahead and make the adjustment and come left a minute. Yeah, all right, give me, that's a meal scope, mitt. Is that it? MRAD correction? MRAD. All right, give me three clicks, right? All right, Steve, center target, first target, 12 o'clock. Other diamond, go ahead and give me a shot. Need you to come up four clicks. Come left, 1.6. One more. All right. Same shot, 12 o'clock. Perfect. 
do it again. Another shot. All right, you stack the last two. Go ahead and give me uh, three clicks left. Same shot, 12 o'clock. Right. All right, everybody's real close. What I want you to do is go ahead and give me a five round group. Find something very refined on that piece of paper to aim at. All right, load bipods heavy, consistency every time. Do the same thing. Try and get a five round group and we'll adjust off that if we need to fine tune. All right, bottom left target, 12 o'clock on the diamond. Bottom left diamond, 12 o'clock, five round group. All right, make sure you load your bipods. Real consistent, every shot. Really refine what you're doing. I just switched to my my uh, 300 Win Mag bolt gun, and I was trying to zero it, and um, I'm shooting high. It looks like two feet above the target, and I'm bottomed out right now. I can't do it, and I think it's because of my mounting system. All right, I tell you what, let's do. Uh, let's find let's see, a reference target to shoot off of in the dirt. All right, look below target number one. There's a yellow bush. 12 o'clock of that. Give me a shot. Yeah, you're, you're four mils high right now. All right, come down four mils. Okay, I'm, it's bottomed out. I'm right, already, how much was you able to I was able down? to come down one mil. All right, one mil. So you're gonna be still, you're gonna be three mils high. All right, you've got 20 minutes in your rail and that mount has 20 minutes in it too. So that's a little bit too much for that system. So about 40 mils. Okay. So there's either one of two ways that we can work with this. One, you can take 20 minute scope mount, turn it backwards on a 20 minute rail, and it'll make everything flat. So I can flip the rear one around. Yep. And that zeroes it out. Yep, and it'd zero it out. Okay. All right, just a kind of quick common sense approach, or I can show you something that else that we can actually continue to use and make it happen right now. Let me show you something. Okay. What I want you to do is go ahead and give me a shot Aim uh, six o'clock on the bottom diamond. We gotta figure out where you're at. Center diamond, first target, six o'clock. Got hit in the head? No? Yeah, you're right in the neckline. You're actually about three mils high. I'm gonna make you five mils high. You've got a regular mil dot reticle. I do. All right. Regular mil dot reticle, I'm gonna actually place your zero at the top duplex. And then we, it's what we call a poor man's horse. We do it with a lot of other Gen 2 mill dots or any type of mill dot scope. We'll actually zero our crosshairs at 100 meters and then either dial up 17.2 minutes of angle or as close as we can get with that scope, or we'll dial up five mils, which is the same equivalent. Okay. All right, so go ahead and give me two mils up right from right now. Okay. All right, is that two? That was two. Well, that's two. All right. All right. What I want you to do now is hold top left diamond, hold center with your duplex, top duplex. So we're five mils above our crosshair now. Top left diamond, so. Top left diamond, center. All 
All right, need you to come left. Same hold, duplex, but I need 0.7 left on your dial. Same hold. Yeah, top left diamond, top duplex. All right, go ahead, give me one more shot. All right, come back right, two clicks. All right, left and right's good. All right, from there, we're actually gonna line up from now and you just run into what we call a poor man's horse. So you start out at the top, duplex is at 100 meters, one meal down equals one meal down, five meals is your crosshair, 10 meals is the bottom duplex. Oh, me down, okay. It's the same as just doing pure holes, but now we're using the top half of the reticle. So I can actually use this system. Yep, absolutely. So it's kind of like a problem, problem solving on the range. On the range. We don't have the right, right. equipment, but now we could go ahead and flip the, the scope mount around and actually fix a problem that way, or we can continue and fix a problem in the field. It's kind of like a broke scope drill. I kind of like that there because it's simple to count. Yeah, know? it is. You don't have to remember any holes. It's not like the 500 meter hold over, hold under drills. Uh, I was getting some kids ready to go to SODIC out of one of the groups that I was training, and we were actually teaching some of the stuff that they teach in SODIC, and one being the 500 meter hold over, hold unders. And when I looked at it, the reason that you would actually do that is for speed. You know, the reason you'd come up with that kind of drill. But the reality is you're gonna have 3.8 dialed on your scope. You know, that's where you're actually zeroed right now. And then if you have a target at 400, that holds 2.4, so you're gonna have to be above your reticle or above the crosshair, 1.4 mils. But you're doing math. Math isn't fast. No, I'm not right? good at that. But yeah. you're gonna know that when he says, hey, target's 400, you're gonna hold 2.4, yeah. 2.4 down from, from the, the top. top. So that's all, just there keep There's no math. It's just, you remember your holes and it's all right there. That's really easy, actually. And even with not the right gear. And now but you, I, could, I would actually, I actually like that better almost. Now the only, the only thing that you gotta kinda watch is, uh, it gives you, you know, when you're running night vision or something like that, if you're running a PVS-22 and now you dial down and you're in a second focal plane, of course this one's not, but if you're in a second focal plane, and you dial down, you've got to come down to half power. And if at half power, it makes all the mill dots worth two. So really, you're zeroed two and a half mils above your crosshair right now, the equivalent of five mils. So it, it gets, gets in the way, but there would be no reason to ever run it that way unless you, like this, we had the equipment problem that we fixed in the field. We just have to be aware at that time. But now it gives you the ability to actually utilize all, all of your scope instead of just the bottom five mils. Okay. All right. Let's load up.